I'm Ari Gronich, and this is Create a New Tomorrow Podcast. Welcome back to another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Gronich, and I have with me Paul Smith. Paul is a uh, former Procter & Gamble uh, uh, employee with consumer con uh, communications and research. Uh, he's one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 leadership speakers in 2018. His work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, Time, Forbes, and Success Magazine, among others. An MBA from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, a best-selling author, uh, and he leads with a story. And I'm going to let him kind of get into what it is that he's going to be doing and talking about because he's an incredible storyteller and he talks about leadership with that. So, Paul, why don't you kind of give an, uh, an update of background on why you became who you are and, and what you have to offer people that is absolutely needed in, in the world at the moment? Uh, yeah, I think, Ari, what you just covered was my, my background up until about 2012. Uh, so at that point, I was 20 some odd years into my professional corporate career. Um, and along that path, I just got fascinated with this concept of storytelling. And, um, and that kind of frustrated me because, you know, they, they didn't teach me about storytelling at, at the Wharton School. They didn't teach me that when I joined um, uh, Accenture. They didn't teach me that when I joined the Procter & Gamble Company. Um, but yet I was, I was beginning to recognize how important of a skill set that was to be successful in the profession that I was in, uh, or in business in general. And so I started interviewing leaders whom I admired and thought were particularly good at it first inside the company and then outside the company. And I mean, at this point I'm up to around 300 or so like individual one-on-one -on -one, face to face, two hour long interviews I've conducted with these CEOs and executives from all over the world, like 25 countries around the world. Um, and pretty quickly in that journey, I realized that, you know, if I want to know this that badly, probably other people do as well. And so it stopped being my own little selfish learning journey and became an idea for a book. Um, and so that, that's what led to my first book, Lead with a Story, which came out in, in 2012. Um, and then that led to another and another and another. And I, my, my fifth book just came out a few months ago. And so what I ended up doing was pretty quickly leaving my corporate career and becoming a full-time author and speaker and trainer on the subject of storytelling for leaders or for salespeople. I've got one of my books is on, you know, uh, sell with a story for salespeople. One, there's one for parents, you know, uh, a couple of them are for, for leaders. And so, uh, yeah, it just led to a radical uh, shift in my career. So, so in the last eight years, this is what I've done full-time as research and write on the subject of the art and the science of storytelling to help you be more effective at work and then conducting uh, speaking engagements and training um, workshops on those topics. So do you think that storytelling has become a, uh, a dying art as far as practice or do you believe that it's gonna have a resurgence? Because I know that for me at least, my cultural history is all about storytelling. You know, if, if you look back, it's like, you know what happened back then because that person who was there told their grandfather, or, you know, told their kid who told their kid who told their kid who told their kid. And, and that's how, um, at least in my culture, we, we learn. And so, but a lot of cultures, it's not that way so much as dictatorial here's what you do, but there's no context of the story behind it. So how does, how does that play out in, in modern world? And why is it that it's such a fascinating thing? We all love to hear people's stories. Yeah. So I think personally, you know, in people's lives, I think storytelling has always been, um, you know, an important part of human socialization and family and, and things like that in the working world. What my, um, what I've learned through my research in this is that I think storytelling was actually important even in the business world, you know, or the, uh, the world of commerce for centuries. Um, but then I think there was a period of time in the early 1900s where it fell out of favor. 
you know, that's when you started to have professional business schools, you know, you know Harvard and Wharton and, you know, et cetera, training people to become professional business people, which before that really wasn't a thing, right? If you, a professional was a, a lawyer or a doctor or something, but a business, anybody could be a business person, right? Just go start a company. Well, in the early 1900s, we started to credentialize and professionalize business. And if you wanted to be viewed as part of the avant-garde part of new business, you, you, you probably didn't do a lot of storytelling because that seemed old school, right? You know, a, a new business leader would lead with a bunch of spreadsheets and, and like you said, dictatorial, you know, methods of leading and, and, you know, having a very clear vision and using a bunch of uh, management techniques and things like that. And storytelling wasn't one of them. And so it, I think it fell out. I think you asked if is storytelling, you know, falling out of favor. I know I think it did fall out of favor a hundred years ago. And about 20 or so years ago, I think it started to make its resurgence into the business world because there are a lot of uh, books written on the topic of leading, you know, with stories starting about 20 years ago. And, and, and mine, so, so mine was certainly not the first of them and it won't be the last. Um, but about 20 years ago, the resurgence, the interest in bringing storytelling back into the business world started. And I think we're still, still early in that resurgence and more and more people are becoming interested in how to use storytelling to either be a better leader, be a better salesperson, be a better marketer, uh, to, to help them communicate their, their ideas better, even if, they're don't, if they don't fit into any of those buckets. Uh, so that's where I think we are. I think we're on an upswing, not a downswing. Okay. Sounds good to me. Cause I, I, again, I, I really like having stories be part of, of at least for, for me, my business itself, you know, why everybody always asks, why did you become this performance therapist? And I have to tell them, you know, I, I started out as an athlete. I was five years old. I was playing, you know, th well, three years old doing gymnastics, five years old, martial arts, playing baseball, doing all these things. And I kept getting injured and so therefore, I had to figure out how to heal myself. And, you know, that story is kind of the, the re repetition that I play out when, when somebody asks. Um, I know a friend of mine is doing these things called uh, the story of your business. And they are books about why you started your business. And they're like coffee table books and things. And, and that's starting slowly to, to build. So how do we build that momentum so that it becomes second nature again for people to be storytellers? And do we need our population to actually connect together again? Because, you know, block parties, same thing. People are so separated that it doesn't occur to them maybe. So is, is that a, a possibility to, to rebuild that culture. And do you think that the storytelling will bring us together versus separating us apart? Yeah. So there, there are a few things in there to unpack. First of all, uh, about that coffee table book about the story of your, your business. Um, that typically, I would call that uh, the, the main story there is the founding story. Um, and, and I think that's a very important story for businesses, for people, for leaders to be able to tell about the company they work in. Um, in fact, I think it's the first story you need to be able to tell, um, uh, but it's not the only one. And in fact, when people say the story of our business, um, they, they often make the mistake of assuming, well, we just have one story. Like, you know, uh, in fact, companies will hire me to, hey, uh, we need you to come and help us tell our story better. And the first question I ask them when I get on the phone with them just to plan the event is, when you say our story, what, what do you mean? And then they say all these things. Oh, well, you know, we've got this really unique process of, in, of innovation. And, you know, the way, our, the way the company started was really unique. And uh, our strategy is, is, uh, is really interesting. And uh, the first product that we've ever made. So, yeah, we want you to help us tell that story. But you realize you just rattled off like five different stories. I mean, you, you don't have one story. I mean, that would be a novel, right? If you were to write your one story. And nobody in a business conversation has time to listen to a three hour story. They don't have time to listen to a 30 minute story. You know, you need, these are three or four minute stories that you would tell. So the story of somebody's life is a series of short stories. And that's what I, people need to realize is 
you, you don't have one big story. You have a bunch of little stories and, and you need to figure out which ones are important and when to tell each one, because there is zero opportunities to tell all of them in one sitting. That'll never happen, right? So you need to figure out which ones, which of those little stories are the most important and the founding story is one of them. But it's just a three or four minute story about why the founder of the company founded the company. It's not about the 25 years since then and all the money you've made and the successes and the failures. And those are all different stories. The founding story is just about that one instant where the, the owner said, you know what? I am done working at this company. I'm going to start my own company. I hate it here. <laughs> you know, like nobody ever, ever quit their job, risked everything to go start a, a business for a boring reason. There's always an interesting story behind that, but that's story number one. So what, what I, what I did in my last book is called the 10 stories, great leaders tell. And I, I just try to outline it. It's a very short book. You can read it in, in an hour. It's just about what are the most important 10 stories, but it's, but it's, that's only 10. There are dozens more that you should tell. But if, if you're interested, I can tell you what those 10 are, but the founding story is number one. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's first is uh, where we, I call it a, where we came from story. That's your founding story. All right. But it's not everything that happened after that, just the founding story. The second one is why we can't stay there. So that's a case for change story. There's probably something going on in your business that you need to make a change. Where we're going is the third story. So that's a vision story um, and how we're going to get there, which is a strategy story because a strategy is about how you're going to get from where you are now to where you want to be. So if you think about those four stories, those first four, any leader who can tell those four stories can easily articulate where we came from, why we can't stay there, where we're going and how we're going to get there. And that's the kind of direction that everybody needs in an organization to come from the leaders, right? right. And that's four different stories. It's not one story. It's four different stories. So the next four kind of go together as well, but they're more about who we are as an organization. So that's what we believe. That's a corporate values story. Uh, who we serve. So that's a, a story about the customer. So everybody can get a visceral feel for who we're working for. What we do for our customer. So that's a classical sales story and how we're different from our competitors. So that's, a, I call it a marketing story because marketing is generally about how you're different from your competition. Um, so again, if you can tell those four stories, you can easily articulate who we are, who we work for, what we do for them and how we're different than our competitors, right? Every leader has got to be able to do that. And that leaves two more. So the last two are, <clears throat> the last two are more personal to you, the leader. Why I lead the way I do. So that's a personal leadership philosophy story and why you should want to work here. Not you, but whoever you're talking to, right? right. Uh, so that's a recruiting story because every leader's job is to make sure talented people come into the organization and follow the leadership. Now, there are dozens of other types of stories that I cover in my, my other books, but if I had to pick a most important 10, those would be the most important ones. So like start there, but then continue to build your storytelling repertoire. But you got to recognize those are all different stories. So there is no one story for a company. There are lots of them. So is this something that, that you would recommend? Like nowadays, everything is online. So should this be something that, that we do online as like a video as well as you know, a written version of it so that people can really feel the energy of the person when they're telling that story or, um, I know as a yeah, I think video is a, yeah, video is a fabulous medium to tell stories, right? Because it's so much richer than just the written word on a piece of paper or on a blog post or something like that. So yeah, I definitely encourage people. In fact, several of my clients, um, you know, after we go create a story with them, they'll go hire somebody to help produce a video. In fact, I'm, I'm now starting to partner with somebody. I've got a call with them right after this um, with a production studio in California to do exactly that, to take stories from idea to concept to story scripting, and then all the way to having it, you know, produced into a final video. I think that's a, a fabulous way. And, and it's easier to tell it then because you don't have to be there face to face every time. They can just, they can go watch the video. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a, I have a friend's company that does the videos and another friend who does books, which is, is really interesting. One's in Miami and one's a, a nomad at this point, traveling nomad. Uh, in those stories, there are certain elements that people would probably want to highlight and uh, accentuate, you know? So what are the kind of elements that somebody who's watching the video would want to hear or see or feel based on what's going on in, in that story. So what are like the, the basic elements? 
Yeah. So, well, the first and most important thing for the person telling the story to understand is what, what's the lesson that you want the audience to learn? You know, like, in fact, what do you want them to think, feel, or do are the three things I coach people? Like you, you need to, you need to have an objective in your mind. You, you shouldn't just be telling people stories to entertain them, right? Um, you're telling them for a reason. You're trying to accomplish something. You're either trying to get somebody to think, feel, or do something different than they are today. Um, so start, you start with that. And then once you have that end in mind, then you go pick the story to tell that will accomplish that objective, right? So then you got to go find something that actually happened in the world, in your experience, in your business, in your personal life or whatever, that will motivate somebody to do that, to either think, feel, or do something differently. And then you craft that into a story. And so, uh, but, but you start with the end in mind, right? What do I want people to think, feel, or do differently? Go find a story that will convince them of that. Then you craft the story. And there are little things that you'll want to do to make the story effective, like have the right structure to the story. These are just, like I said, three or four minute stories. So, you know, you, you need to have a tight structure. And I, I teach a very specific structure, the eight questions your story needs to answer. And in this particular order for the story to make the most sense. And there are specific techniques that you can use to create the right emotional engagement in a story. Um, there are techniques to create a surprise ending in a story, which is, uh, it may be not as obvious, but is actually important in a business story, not just for an entertainment Hollywood story. And that's because a surprise actually makes the story more memorable. And if the story is more memorable, then your idea will be more memorable. You know, you also want to use dialogue. And so they're all, all the, the kind of things that, you know, somebody in Hollywood would use. You can use the same techniques to create your little three minute story that they're using on a bigger scale. That's awesome. So I'm, I'm going to take it a little bit away from the business side at, at this moment, and I'm going to I'm going to push it into what kind of is going on in our current world with politics. One of the things that I loved about Ross Perot. <laughs> yes, I loved Ross Perot. Yeah, God rest his soul. Now here's what we got to do. We got to get rid of that NAFTA business right there. But what he would do, different than any politician that I've seen in modern, at least, times, is he would go on, he would purchase 30-minute slots, and he would explain a policy and the reason why that policy wasn't good. And here's the numbers, and here's the information, and here's what it's going to do to the community, right? And he would explain it in ultra detail. And I wonder why the politicians go and do these mini like sound bites and they never go on and really take the time to tell the story of, of their policy, of what they're doing, of why they're doing it to get the onboarding of the citizenry. They scare them with the sound bites. The stories would, it, you know, in my opinion, enlighten them. So, yeah, so a, a few things in that. Um, first of all, uh, um, I, I think the, our entire society has suffered a radical shortening of our attention span in the last couple of like, decade or so. And that's unfortunate. And I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons to blame for that. You know, social media has done that. Television has done that. Uh, you know, um, we, we all have a very short attention span. When, when I started doing training videos uh, for LinkedIn Learning out in California, um, you know, we had seven or eight minute video segments that we would shoot for a, you know, one or two hour training course. Well, now they want them in two or three minutes, you know, because just because people's attention, they can't, I can't watch a video for more than three minutes without checking my phone, you know, which is kind of sad, but um, so that's part of the problem. Um, the other thing I think I would, I would say about that is that um, that 30 minute detailed explanation that Ross Perot would give about his policy. I don't call that a story. I call that a, th a 30 minute explanation, right? I mean, he, he's explained, he's going into detail about the numbers and, you know, and, and I think we need that. Um, storytelling should not be the only communication vehicle that you use. In fact, it shouldn't even be the most frequent one. In fact, I, I tell the folks I coach that only 10 to 15% of the words coming out of your mouth should be in the form of a story. 85 to 90% of the time you're talking or writing or whatever should be normal prose, right? It should be like what Ross Perot was doing. Just somebody, I'm just explaining this to you. Let me just explain my idea to you. But 10 to 15% of the time. So if you've got a one hour meeting, 
10 to 15% is six to nine minutes. So out of that Ross Perot half hour, that's three to five minutes out of a half an hour, I think he should be telling a story. And these stories are only two or three or four minutes long. So he's got time for one or two store, short stories during that 30 minutes. And those stories are going to be helpful to illustrate the point he's going to make. So he can, he can talk about, you know, how to get rid, we ought to get rid of this NAFTA thing. And here are my five reasons why, and here's the impact it's going to have on our economy. And it's going to have an impact on real people too. So for example, there's a guy named Bob I met down in Dallas, Texas last month, and he got, he lost his job because his job got moved over to, you know, to Mexico. And, and, you know, he's going to tell a, a personal story about that guy and how NAFTA impacted his life and his family and his kids and then he's going to get back to the you know next idea on his list. But that's just going to be a three or four minute, two or three minute story that he tells in the middle of that 30 minute discussion. We need the 30 minute discussion. But if you were to ask people a week after that Ross Perot 30 minute explanation, what they remember the most from it, what do you think it's going to be? The story. It's going to be the three minute story about Bob who got fired in Dallas, right? right. So, but if all he did was tell stories for 30 minutes, Nobody would know what to remember. So you can't over, you shouldn't overuse storytelling either. You need to explain it and then use stories to punctuate the key ideas and make it memorable and compelling. Right. Hold on one second. I just got to turn on a light. It's a little bit green on my face. <laughs> Awesome. That's a little bit better. I don't look like a motion anymore. <laughs> All right. So, so I watch, uh, you know, politicians all the time and, and they'll go into that story of the person that was affected by the thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it'll sound contrived. Mm -hmm. The story sounds made up almost, even if it's not, it, it, it's very polished. Are stories supposed to be really polished or are they supposed to be authentic? Because that, that is what connects with me. Although I see the politicians and, and it never feels really authentic, the stories that they're telling. Yeah, I, I agree. And that's why I, 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 don't, I don't write books about storytelling for politics because I, uh, I, I do feel like they mostly come across that way. So if, if you find yourself uh, ever using the words, let me tell you a story, nothing that comes after that is going to sound authentic, right? Uh, so it, yeah, it's when, that, it's when that politician makes their point and then they go, so let me tell you a story about Bob in, in Dallas. Well, you, you've already made it sound like a big production. And, and, he, and if he delivers that story in a really p polished way, yeah, it's going to sound contrived and, uh, and, and lack authenticity. Um, in fact, when I was doing the research for the, my book, Sell with a Story, I interviewed obviously a bunch of salespeople, but I also interviewed buyers, professional procurement managers who listen to salespeople sell to them all day. And I asked them, what is it that makes a sales pitch sound like a sales pitch? And they all told me the same thing. They said, the moment the conversation turns from conversational, the tone of the conversation turns from conversational and extemporaneous to something that sounded scripted and memorized, they say, that's when I knew the sales pitch had started. And that's when the hairs on the back of my neck would stand up and I would get defensive. And like, you know, you don't want to have that effect on people. And that's the same effect I think those politicians have on people when they go into that kind of a, a storytelling mode. And so I, I tell people, you know, the, the tone of your voice shouldn't change when you start to tell a story. It, it should just, it should flow in the conversation very naturally. So if somebody were to ask you, if you're in the office and you're in a in a meeting with somebody and they tell you about a problem they're having and you're the boss and you say something like, yeah, that's a tough problem. Let me tell you what I did five years ago when I, when I had your job and I ran into that problem. And then you start telling your story. Like that's a genuine story. Okay. I've got that problem. And you're about to tell me what you did when you had my job and you ran into that problem. Now I don't know yet if you were successful at it or you were a failure at it, 
but either way, I'm going to learn something. Right. right. So I want to hear that story. So that's a much better way to, to move into a story than let me tell you a story. And then you're going to deliver it and you're going to have some ums and errs, and it's not going to be perfectly polished and you're not going to have memorized it word for word. And, and because that's not the way people talk. People don't talk in perfect grammar. They talk in halts and stops and they will start a sentence over and they'll, you know, stutter a little bit and your story should sound the same way. So in fact, I tell people, um, don't even script your story out word for word, because if you do, you'll be tempted to memorize it. So you should only script out your, you shouldn't script it, only write down your story in bullet points. So just, and it's the answer to the eight questions. I know I haven't told you what the eight questions are, but you know, the eight questions your story needs to answer. You should have bullet point answers to the eight questions. And that's what you memorize. That's like the outline of your story. And then every time you tell the story, it'll sound like the first time you've ever told the story because it will be the first time you've ever told the story exactly that way, right? So, you know, it's funny because I, I've done a lot of speaker training. I was, uh, you know, Peak Potentials, train the trainers, John Childers and his $25,000 speaker trainer, which back then was uh, probably one of the best speakers on the planet, John Childers. I mean, uh, and, you know, one of my one of my mentors and a lot of people's mentors les brown he's very well known for repeating the same story over and over and over again and it is absolutely memorized however and it's like word for word every time so you could play multiple speaking engagements and and almost you know make them overlap mm -hmm. <laughs> right but he never sounds like, like he's right. going based on a script ever. And right. that's just like a tone. But I, I've actually done as a speaker, I've, I've never written out a full script. I can't. It actually hurts my brain and, right. and my soul to write a, a full script for, for something. I like to be able to be spontaneous. And I find that the script keeps me from being more rubbery. Right. So uh, yeah, let me, because I know the kind of person you're talking about and I know people, speakers who, who do that. And there are probably some of the stories that I tell when I, you know, and I've, uh, I'm a professional speaker as well. And I've done, you know, like thousands of engagements and there are some stories I've probably told a thousand times. And some of those stories probably are like that. You could probably roll the tape back that way. Uh, the difference is most people aren't professional speakers. They're not professional actors, right? So if you're going to tell, if you are a professional speaker and you're going to tell a certain story in front of an audience hundreds and hundreds of times, yeah, go ahead and, 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 and memorize it and use the techniques that that guy probably uses to make it sound a little bit fresh every time. But most people, 99% of the people, you know, are not a professional speaker. They're just, you know, I'm, I'm a vice president at a bank and I, I need to be a better leader or I'm a salesperson for, uh, you know, computers or whatever, and I need to do a better job of it. Um, and so, and I need to learn to tell it. There's, there's different stories I need to tell all the time and I may only tell them two or three or four times and then that story's done. So most of us need help telling those kind of stories, not the story I'm going to tell hundreds and hundreds of times. So I think the rules are a little bit different. If you're one of those people, yeah, you could probably get away with it, but most of us aren't that person. Gotcha. So how does this, you know, go back, going back to, you know, we, we talk politics, we talk a business a little bit, but also personal life. So you're, you're, uh, you're an adult and you're going to make a friend, which is probably one of the hardest things post-college that any adult does is make friends. And they want to express to the person that they meet that they seem to get along with and like who they are, right? Is there a story for that that somebody can practice as well or, or somebody can have them? I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to put, what are the applications that are outside of the box a little bit? Yeah, so, well, first of all, my, my second book, Parenting with a Story, is about stories, personal stories, stories that you tell at home, not the kind of stories you tell at work. Um, but, but there are more stories to teach life lessons that a parent would use to teach their kids, you know, the value of uh, integrity or open mindedness or creativity or curiosity or hard work or fairness, you know, those kind of virtues that you want your kids to have. But if your goal is friendship, 
Now that one of those chapters is on friendship, by the way, but if your goal is making new friends and you're looking for the type of stories you would tell when you're meeting people, um, what I find is uh, helpful there is to tell a self-deprecating story, right? A, a story about, you know, a, a silly mistake you made or something stupid you did one time. And the reason is because that humanizes us, right? And nobody wants to make new friends with somebody who's so full of themselves that they're just, they're just arrogant. And so if you tell a story about, well, let me tell you about uh, when my first book hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Let me, that's a fascinating story. Let me tell you about that. Well, it's maybe fascinating to you, but it's not going to be to the people listening, right? But if, let me tell you about the first time I got fired. Oh my God, it was so embarrassing. Who wants to hear that? Everybody. <laughs> I mean, just because it's funny and, you know, and, and everybody loves to laugh at somebody else's misery. And plus maybe they'll learn something from it. So yeah, telling your own self-deprecating failure story is a great story to tell when you're meeting new people, I, I think. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I do it all the time, but I have so many to, to pick from. <laughs> yeah, I, so many failures, yeah. I figure, you know, I'm a very balanced person, equal parts of genius and idiot, equal parts of damage, <laughs> you know, and trauma and, and, uh, and benefit, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty balanced person that way. So <laughs> I tell, I tell some of those kinds of stories, you know, yeah. but I mean, that to me is how I connect. And one of the things that I know about our world these days is that we are all connected without being connected at all. Hmm. You know, we, we all can, we can all comment on each other, talk to each other, do, but nobody is being, or very few, at least in the society are being really deep and dirty and dark with their stuff because everything is a selfie culture these days. It's like, what is the best angle for my face? What is right. the best, you know, look for, you know, I, I just made some food. How can I make it so that the picture will look good so I can right. post it on something? And it's, yeah. it's this unreal, inauthentic way of being with each other that I think is damaging the society as a whole in such innumerable ways. And it's that inauthenticity of connection that we're, that we're experiencing. And so I'm, I'm, I guess, looking for ways that we can, you know, this whole create a new tomorrow is about how do we take ourselves, I am, you know, my, my new book series I, I, that I'm in the middle of writing right now is called Tribal Living in a Modern Society. And uh, it's going to be a series. The first one is the corporate culture revolution. But it's all about how do we get back to living more in a tribal way, which involves things like sitting around a fire with people and sharing stories. Mm -hmm. And how do we get back to that in corporations, in uh, our families? <laughs> I mean, how many people do you know that still sit around the table with their kids every single night for dinner and talk about Not the day? Many. Not, Not very many. many. And so that's where it's like, I'm trying to, I want to get this, the world, and it's my own feeling and my own you know, like selfish uh, wish, want, desire. So, you know, it may not be anybody else's, but I feel like people are longing for what that is that they're missing. And a lot of yeah. that storytelling, the time that we spend with each other talking about our history, our past, I think that's what's going to solve a lot of the race issues when people start listening to the stories and hearing them without that reactive mind. So that's the other part is when you're telling a story, making it as easy as possible for the listener to digest without reaction, right? So is there, is there a way to do that obviously better and, you know, and be able to tell that story without causing the reactions? This is going to be good for any audience member who's in a relationship as well, whether it's your boss or a, or a partner, if you can tell your story without them having a reaction, right? Yeah, well, maybe I'm not sure I understand the, 
the question because typically when you tell a story, you want your audience to react. So what, what, what are you saying you want to tell a story without a reaction? Of, of, um, so let's say I'm talking to somebody of another race and they're telling me the story of their experience with people of my race. I don't want, I want to be able as a listener to hear them without react, going into a reaction about like, well, he's telling me I'm bad or you know, oh, without feeling attacked, feeling attacked without, you know, that, that whole reactiveness based on ego attack. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's exactly where storytelling can help. Um, in, in fact, I'm, I'm working on a, a diversity and inclusion course with LinkedIn right now to do, to accomplish exactly this, where we have people who've, you know, people of color who've suffered these kind of indignities, sharing their stories, and um, what what I think makes that effective is that it allows the listener, people like you and me, to get inside their head to try to experience their experience from their viewpoint. That's what the so they'll tell a story from a first person point of view. Let me tell you what happened to me my first day on the job at this company. You know, I went there and this terrible thing happened and this terrible thing, you know, and then I, I felt inadequate and I, I felt like, you know, they, they didn't want me there. And, you know, they, they go through their whole terrible experience, uh, but without ever naming the person who did this and the person who did that to them. So when you're listening to this a story, if it's done well, I think the natural human inclination would be to feel empathy for the person because you're seeing their world through their eyes, walking through it in their shoes. And that's what the story can do. Whereas if you're not using stories and you're just saying, look, 89.6% uh, of African-Americans feel uh, like they've experienced uh, one racial incident per week in their life at the hands of a white male. Okay, well, guess what? If you're a white male, you're gonna feel attacked. But if I just tell you a story about somebody when they experience some you know, it, racial indignity, I, I think you'll feel less attacked and you'll feel more involved in the story. You'll feel more empathy. So I think that's what storytelling can do. Um, it, if I could, can, I, I kind of want to mulligan and go back to a, yeah, absolutely. one of the questions you asked earlier about, um, you know, telling these personal stories for friendship purposes and this book series that you're working on, this, this idea might help you. Um, there was a study done by, a survey done by, uh, I can't remember who did it at this point. Anyway, it was it was back in the around the year two thousand. New York Times uh, did the study, and they asked people what percentage of people in the world are trustworthy, and the answer was somewhere around twenty or thirty percent. It was really low, <laughs> which is sad. And then they asked the same question, but a slightly different way. They said, "What percent of people that you know personally are trustworthy?" And the answer went up to like eighty or ninety percent. And you don't have to be a, a math genius to realize that there's something wrong there. Like, uh, unless the people who uh, are not trustworthy don't know anybody, <laughs> on average, those two numbers should be the same, right? If you're doing a random sample of people, but they're not, and they'll never be the same. And the reason is because it's not that the people who know other people, the people that they know are happen to be more trustworthy than the people they don't know. It's just that people trust people they know more than they trust people they don't know, right? We def our default setting is not to trust people. And once we get to know them, as long as you don't give them a reason not to trust you, as they get to know you more, they'll just naturally, you move into this circle of trust. Well, now I, I know you, so I trust you. You know, even though you haven't really earned it, but you just, I know you. And so the reason I bring that up is because storytelling is the shortest distance between being a stranger and a friend, right? I mean, I can read you my resume and you still won't feel like you know me, but I could tell you a couple of stories about what happened to me as a kid and what happened to me last week. And all of a sudden, you know me personally, just a little bit. And so it won't take six to nine months of us working together for me to earn that trust. All of a sudden, you'll just, you'll know me and I will have moved into that circle of trust for you. So building friend friendships are based on trust, right? So, um, they need to get to know you personally and telling personal, you know, sometimes, you know, um, insightful nuts is not the right word, but uh, vulnerable stories of vulnerableness. That is what will bring you into that circle of trust because they'll feel like they know you tr personally then. So 
this is something I know very well, but a lot of people feel that vulnerability is weakness. I feel like vulnerability is your biggest strength. So how do we get people, how, how do they feel vulnerable without feeling weak? Um, well, I, th I think if, <laughs> I'm not sure why people, I think people that feel that vulnerability makes them weak probably just haven't tried it because they're too afraid to, right? Uh, so if you were to tell, so remember we talked about self-deprecating stories earlier, right? So you're, so say you're the boss of some small department at work um, and you're afraid to tell any of your failure stories because it'll make you look weak. Okay, well, you're, you're probably not a very good boss. <laughs> But, but if just try it, try telling a story to your group about one of about your three biggest mistakes you ever made in your career. First one got me fired. Second one almost got me fired from that job. Third one was terrible. Um, but, uh, you know, I didn't get fired, whatever, you know, and, and you tell them about what you did in each of those over the last 30 years, here are the three biggest mistakes I made. Your, your audience will love you for that because you've just taught them three terrible things to never do at work. Right. And so what you're telling them is I care more about your growth and development than I do my own ego. I want, I'm telling you these stories so that you won't make the same mistakes that I made. Now I'm the boss here. So obviously, you know, I've done a lot of good things too. Right. So somebody's promoted me to this point. So I'm obviously not terrible, but yeah, I'm human. So I've made mistakes. Here are my three biggest. So do that and see how your people respond. Do they do they try and leave the company or like, I don't want to work in this department anymore. Apparently my boss is stupid. He made three mistakes or, you know, I don't want to work for her anymore because she's weak. Like you will never, ever get that reaction. The reaction you'll get is, wow, thanks. I want to work for her more often. Like I want to work for her forever because she cares more about my growth and development than she does her own ego. So I think if you try it once, you'll realize, oh, it didn't make me weak. It made people admire me as a leader. And then you won't have that fear anymore. Nice. So is, is there, well, let's go with the, uh, the eight questions, right? Let's take them. Yeah, oh, yeah. Let's, let's you hear the uh, structure of a story. Right. Let's take them step by step and just kind of, Here's what, here's what we could do. Give them an example and then tell them what the questions are. So like a short two minute story. And then here's what I was answering. Yep. Okay. So I'll give you an example of that. Uh, number eight, I think is that the marketing story, the why, uh, how we're different from our competitors story. Um, so um, actually, you know what, let me do a different one. Uh, it sounds like your audience is not all necessarily uh, business people. So I'll, I'll do number nine on the list, which is a leadership philosophy story, which is also more of a personal story. So this guy named uh, Mike Figliolo, who um, uh, went to West Point. So he's an arm, was an army guy. Um, his first leadership opportunity was uh, leading a platoon of uh, tanks, right? So, um, and his first opportunity to test his leadership was in a training exercise out in uh, Camp Pendleton, California, maybe. Um, anyway, out in California, imagine a 10 mile long, five mile wide uh, practice field, and they're going to go into uh, battle, like literally going to be 400 tanks on this side of the field and 400 tanks on this side of the field. And they're going to go into this exercise. Now they're not, not shooting live ordinances, they're like shooting laser beams and with a little receiver so that you know, but it's real tanks with real people, but not real weapons. Anyway, he happened to be assigned to be in the first tank that's going to go into battle on his side of the field with 400 tanks. So of course, then, you know, and they're all following him. So the night before he sits down with the commanding officer and they go through a map of the terrain and figure out where the high ground is and the best strategy to win the exercise. So the next morning the exercise starts and he's in his tank and they're racing out onto the field. Well, he gets a couple of minutes into it and he gets to the place where he's got to make a decision to turn left or right. And he doesn't know what to do. Like, I guess looking at a field through the crack in the hatch of a tank bouncing up and down at 40 miles an hour just looks a little different than it does on a map in a conference room, right? So he's got a decision to make. He can either stop the tank, turn on the light, get the map out, figure out the right thing to do, which might take, I don't know, 30 seconds, or he can just guess. Well, Mike chose option two. He just yells out, driver, turn left, even though he had no idea if that was the right thing to do, but he said it like he meant it, right? Driver, turn left. So driver turns left. A couple of minutes later, the light in his tank starts flashing, which means you just got shot by a laser, you're dead. So they'd stop the tank, pop the hash, get out. Those guys are done for the day. 
Well, you know, 30 seconds later, tank number two follow, is following him and they turn left and their little light goes on. Okay, they got shot by a laser. Tank number three turns left, their light goes on, they're done. But the guys in tank number four saw three tanks turn left and get virtually shot and killed, right? So they realized that was a mistake. So tank number four turned right. And then 396 other tanks turned right. They took the high ground and won the exercise, right? So Mike learned a lesson that day. So he made a mistake, right? That was a leadership mistake. He should have turned right. Instead, he turned left, right? But what he learned from that was that sometimes it's more important to make the wrong decision quickly than make the right decision slowly. Could just imagine if he had stopped the tank, turned the light on, got the map out and wasted it, not wasted, but spent those 30 seconds figuring out the right thing to do. What would have happened? Well, there have been 399 other tanks stopped behind him, waiting for him to make a decision, all getting picked off by lasers because they're like sitting ducks out there, right? So, but because war and business and life are all fairly similar in that when you make a mistake, it's going to become obvious pretty soon, right? You'll, things will start going wrong, right? So then you can monitor and adjust. And sometimes it's better, like I said, to make the wrong decision quickly than the right decision slowly, not get stuck in the analysis paralysis that in the business world, we often do. We'll study a situation for six months. Meanwhile, your competition is moving forward. So that story, that's a leadership philosophy story that he uses to explain why he leads the way he does. So when he tell, he'll tell people that story and they'll, they'll recognize, oh, then he's a decisive leader. If I need a decision made quickly, I want to go to him and not somebody else because he's a more decisive leader. And that just lets people understand the kind of leadership to expect from him and that he expects from other people. So that's an example of a, one of these stories. Uh, well, let me let you react to that. And then I'll go into the eight questions about it. It sounds like a ready fire aim. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. It you kind know. of is. Yeah, that's good. Ready fire aim. Mm -hmm. So, so again, in, in my world, uh, if I have a, a word spelled wrong or the commas out of place or things not completely perfect and clear, right? Um, I don't want to put it out there. That's been a habit. I've been learning to put stuff out and then tweak as I go, right? But but it's you know embedded in my spirit from my mom who is uh, you know an old teacher <laughs> and uh, and grammar queen, and so she wants to make sure like everything that I ever put out was proper English and proper commas in the right place and no words unspelled and and everything like that. So that's what I, how I grew up was needing to be perfectionist, but I, I have noticed in my business how costly that is. So is that kind of like a story? I know I, I, I cut it off, but is that kind of like a story? A, a little bit. You'd probably need a little bit more to it. And so I, when I go through these eight questions, you'll probably be able to recognize where yours is missing. Right. A, a couple of these. Uh, no, and yeah, so, I would have gone on. I didn't want to make it about me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I get that interview, but I mean, I'm just, I'm playing with, with what you're, with you're saying to see, cause I want the audience to actually get it right. I want them to be able to walk away from listening to you and say, I can use this to change the world in my world, right. Yeah. To create my new tomorrow today. Because yeah. Well, what I've been doing hasn't been working. I haven't gotten the conversions. I haven't gotten the, the friendships. I haven't gotten the, whatever it is that I'm looking for. And it sounds like the storytelling is kind of like the missing piece mm -hmm. for, for many people, the missing piece to getting everything that they want. Yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll get to the eight questions here in just a second, but let me respond to that. Your, the story that you told and, and, and what would make that a better story. Um, first of all, it would need to be, you'd need, it would need to be a narrative about something specific that happened. So what you said in general was, you know, my mom always, you know, told me to, you know, dot my I's and cross my T's and get everything right. Um, and in the business world, that ended up being a bad decision. That ended up costing me money. Um, well, that sounds like a very general statement about how your mom raised you and a very general statement about how you've run your business. To make it an interesting story, you'd either need to tell about a specific moment when you were a kid where your mother chastised you for not dotting your I's and crossing your T's. Or more powerfully, 
you could leave that part general, but get to, and then tell us one specific moment, a decision you made in business that ended up being a bad decision. And you did it because you were trying to dot all your I's and cross your T's. That would have been an, made an interesting story, but a, a story is uh, a narrative about something interesting that happened to somebody. So it has to be a specific instance in time. And that, that actually leads us into these eight questions. Um, so the first one, by the way, is why should I listen to this story? Right? I call that the hook. You got to give people a reason to listen to your story or they might not. So um, an example of the hook would, would be, um, oh, like I said earlier, uh, wow, Ari, that's a, that's a tough problem. Let me tell you what happened to me five years ago when I had your job and I ran into that problem. That's it. That's the whole hook. That's the answer to question number one. Because I've just told you that if you listen to me for the next two minutes, I'm going to tell you about when I had your job and I ran into that problem. Now you want to listen, right? Mm -hmm. And that's all a hook is supposed to do. It's supposed to get you interested in listening to the actual story. So that's question number one. Why should I bother listening to your story? Once you've answered that question adequately, you've earned the right to answer the next five questions. So here they are. Where and when did it take place? Who's the main character and what did they want? What was the problem or opportunity they ran into? What did they do about it? And how did it turn out in the end? Right? That should, should sound like the natural flow of a story because it is the natural flow of a story. But there's two left, right? So that's only six. Um, what did you learn from it? And what do you think I should go do now? That's number seven and eight, right? Um, so, so the five questions in the middle are actually the story, all right? The first question is the hook that gets you interested. The last two questions are to help drive some behavior, drive a change. You know, what was the lesson? What was the recommended action, right? All that. Um, but the, the five questions in the middle is actually the story. So in your example, um, there, there was no um, where and when did it take place because it wasn't a specific story. It was in general, my mom raised me this way. And in business in general, these things, this has happened, but it, it would need to be last February <laughs> On February 14th, on Valentine's Day, I made a decision to do X with my business and it turned out to be a disaster. And you tell the story about the decision you made on February 14th. That's a specific where and when. Stories need that. If you ever find yourself saying things that don't have a, a time and a place attached to it, it probably is not going to feel like a real story. Too vague. Yeah, too vague. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I hope you all have taken some notes. This is, uh, you know, Paul Smith is just dropping some bombs on y'all. And <laughs> uh, I only say y'all because I, I live in Florida now, but. <laughs> well, I was raised in Arkansas, so uh, I'll, I'll drop a y'all every now and then too. Awesome. So I, you know, I, I, want, I want the audience to, you know, hopefully you guys are all taking notes. Hopefully you're, you're getting to a place where, <laughs> where, uh, my, my iPad just fell <laughs> off, the, off the table. Anyway, um, hopefully you're, you know, as an audience member, you're getting, taking notes and, and learning something that is going to help you in your world and in your life. Cause Paul is just dropping some bombs on you. Give us a, maybe, you know, what is the main thought that your last 20 years has taught you? The main thing, the lesson that the last 20 years of storytelling has taught you? Um, oh, this, there have been a lot, so it's hard to pick one, but I, I, maybe the most important one to mention at this point is that uh, you should treat storytelling like any other skill set uh, that you want to have in life, whether it's in your personal life or your work life. Um, and that is that it, it's worthy of studying uh, to get right. So for example, if, if you wanted to learn to play the guitar, would you just go buy a guitar and put it under your bed and hope that by osmosis, you would learn how to play guitar? Yes. Probably you would. Okay. That probably wouldn't be very effective though, right? <laughs> I would um, learn it, but that's probably what I'd do. Yeah. Yeah. If you actually wanted to learn to play the guitar though, you'd probably go take guitar lessons, right? So you'd go learn it from somebody who knows how to do it. And storytelling is no different, right? And storytelling is an art form for sure. It's not a science, it's an art. Um, but if you wanna learn how to do it, you can. And, and, and maybe that's the other lesson is that um, storytelling is learnable. 
So it's not that, well, some people are just naturally born storytellers and some people are not. And if you're not one of them, well, you just never have that skill. That's not true. It's like any other art form. Like I'm not a naturally gifted musician, but if I wanted to learn to play the guitar, I think I could, right? Uh, you know, I, but I would, I would take lessons from somebody who knew how and I would practice. So if, if the way you want to learn to tell stories is just, well, I'll just, I'll just practice telling more stories. Well, that's like me saying, I'm just going to practice, you know, playing the piano more, or practice the guitar without ever learning how. I'm just going to start strumming it more. Like if you're not likely, you can, but you're not likely to learn very well. Right. So, you know, you, you took uh, classes in college on finance or marketing or whatever, you know, or engineering or whatever it is that you do. You should do the same with storytelling. It's worthy of learning. So pick up a book, take a class, watch a few YouTube videos, you know, whatever you like to learn, learn it. Um, because there are, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the eight questions your story needs to answer. There's, um, you know, certain 10 types of stories you should probably tell. There are techniques to create a surprise ending. There are techniques that you can learn that you won't just figure out on your own by stumbling around and telling more stories. So take it seriously and, and learn it like a skill. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm blessed to do these podcasts and to have had the career that I've had. But what I find most fascinating, and it's the last part of, of that this I, I want to talk about. What I find fascinating is the amount of depth of listening that I get to do by doing this the, mm -hmm. this interview podcast thing that I'm that I'm doing. The 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 level of listening. So I want to know in the storyteller's world, what is the role of the listener? Well, if you don't have a listener, your stories won't uh, uh, make an impact, right? <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe you need to ask a more specific question. Well, the role clearly you need to have listeners. Right, right. But what's their role? What, what, what role do they play? In so, if I'm on stage speaking, I'm watching body language. I'm watching the listeners to see what they're doing, how they're doing it, how they're responding to me. I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on being in the audience, even though I'm up on stage, right? On, mm -hmm. So the listeners have a big, huge role for me and I can play off them. I can do things that rehearsing in, in private never gives me. Yeah, I won't do right so the role of the listener for the person telling the story is is i don't know how else to say that you know yeah have a role. yeah I, I yeah i get it now so what, what role do they play for you the storyteller well um so first of all the most important role they play is it's their job to make meaning from the story right the part of storytelling the benefit of storytelling is that the audience gets to decide what the lesson is if you're just going to boss people around or tell them here are the five reasons why you should buy the product I'm selling, you don't, you don't need to tell any stories. If, if, that, if that's all you want to do is just tell people what to think and do. Now, good luck. That might not be very effective, but um, the benefit of storytelling is that you tell a story and then the audience wants to go do what you wanted them to do without you telling them to go do it, right? You tell your kid a story about how you had a... Uh, you know, a bike accident when you were seven years old, because you weren't, you didn't look both ways before you crossed the street and a car ran into you and broke your leg. Well, guess what? You don't have to tell them to look both ways to cross the street anymore because they will have learned they, they will, they will want to avoid having a broken leg. Um, so, and it's the same in the business world, right? So the purpose of telling stories is for the audience to come to the conclusion themselves. Um, and so their job is to make meaning with the story. So you as the storyteller, you're looking at them for those verbal or those visual cues that they're getting it. Are they looking confused? If, if so, it's the story's probably not connecting right. You know, um, are, are they asking the right questions after the story's over? Like that, that question seven or eight, um, what's the lesson and what's the recommended action? Ideally, the storyteller never answers those questions. It's the audience's job. The storyteller's job is to answer questions one through six. The audience's job is to answer questions seven or eight. 
And if they get it and, and you have to check with them to find out, are you, you know, what lesson do you learn from that? What, what do you think you should go do after that? Um, so after you answer question six, you stop, stop telling the story. The story's over. Now you're, you're trying to drive action with it. Find out what their reaction is. If their reaction, if they, if they drew the right lesson and they're going to go do the right thing, great. Your job is done because they're more likely to do it. People are far more passionate about pursuing their own ideas than they are about pursuing your ideas, right? A story turns your idea into their idea. Now, if they answer question seven or eight and they totally didn't get it right, if they didn't learn the lesson you wanted them to learn, which is a risk, you can just redirect them. You can say, oh, you know, that's a conclusion I thought of too, but I came to a different conclusion and here's why. Or yeah, that's one thing you could go do, but I think this is a better idea and here's why. You can always redirect them like that, but give, give the story a chance to work after that question number six and let them be the meaning maker in the story. Awesome. It, it, you know, that's what I found is that the feedback loop is, is what, you know, for me, an audience drives a feedback loop. And it sounds like that's about the same. Now, it's interesting because you said after question six, then you stop telling the story. And that's kind of like a sales conversation or uh, promoting something. Or if you're like in an advertising agency and you're, you're showing all your, all your campaign that you just created and then you stop. And you have that awkward silence. Hmm. How long do you let that awkward silence last before the the audience, the listener, the customer, this you know, responds back with a question or a comment or a yes or a no, right? So a lot of people will take that silence. The storyteller will take the silence, and if they don't hear the feedback the uncomfortability in the room becomes palatable, right? So how do we avoid that part of it? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is six or seven seconds is like an eternity when there's a silence in a conversation. So it's just almost never happens that there's silence longer than that. So if you're willing to be silent for at least six or seven seconds, the chances are 99% that the other person is going to say something because it's just too uncomfortable. So that's about the, that's about the longest you'd ever have to wait. Um, more importantly, if you tell an interesting story, people are going to want to respond to it. Like when you, when you finish answering question number six, which is how did it turn out in the end? That's the natural conclusion of a story. You're finishing, you're tying up all the loose ends. It, it's a natural place to stop and let them respond. And if it was an interesting story, they will. They'll, they'll either want to comment about the story, they'll want to tell you what they learned from it, or they'll want to tell you a similar story about something that happened to them. That's just the way humans are wired. And so you tell a good story and it will almost naturally elicit a response. If instead you go through the, here are the five reasons why you should buy my product, you know, it's, it's not going to naturally elicit a response or another story or people, you know, people are kind of waiting for you. Okay. Is that it? Is that the end of the sales pitch? Okay. Thanks. I'll think about it. <laughs> you know, um, so stories naturally elicit a, a mirroring response from people. Okay. Reciprocal conversation. Awesome. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to share with the audience? Something that, uh, you know, tips, tricks. I mean, you've, you've been dropping, a lot of uh, actionable steps already, but I always ask, is there two or three or actionable steps that somebody can take to learn, to learn this skill? skill? Mm -hmm. Cause now we, now we know kind of some of the formats, but mm -hmm. the concept is not mm -hmm. implementation. So what are some things that people yeah. do to implement this skill set? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you one more, um, is how to create a surprise ending. Uh, and you can do it with almost any story. And it's important that you do, by the way, um, not just because it makes the story more interesting or entertaining, it, it does that. Um, but in, in business stories or parenting stories, um, your goal is to affect change, right? You're trying to get people to do something different. And uh, it's important for them to remember the story that you tell them because the lesson is embedded in the story. A surprise ending literally, physiologically, makes the story more memorable because 
when somebody is surprised, there's a little bit of adrenaline that's released in their system. And studies show that uh, when you've got more adrenaline in your system, your memory process works better, work more efficiently. So you literally, your memory is improved while that adrenaline is still kind of coursing through your, your system. So, and a surprise triggers that. So there's a practical reason to put a surprise into a, a story like this. Um, and you can put, you can, you can make a surprise ending out of almost any story. And I'll just, I'll illustrate it for you right now. So there's a young boy named James, nine-year-old kid. He's in the kitchen with his mom and his mom's sister. So while mom and auntie are sitting at the kitchen table, having a cup of tea, James is standing at the stove watching the tea kettle boil. And he's just fascinated with it, right? He's watching the jet of steam come out of the top of the tea kettle. And he's got a, got a spoon and he holds it up there into the jet of steam and watches little drops of water condense on the spoon and trickle down and drips into a cup. He's got a little cup sitting there to catch the water. And he's just watching the cycle go over and over and over again. Just fascinated with it. Well, eventually his mother gets, I guess, tired of him in the kitchen and she just barks at him. She's like, James, like, go do your homework, read a book, ride your bike. Like, aren't you embarrassed just wasting your time staring at the tea kettle boiling? Well, fortunately, young James was undaunted by his mother's admonition because 20 years later at the age of 29, of course, and in the year 1765, James Watt reinvented the steam engine, ushering in the industrial revolution that we of course all benefit from today and all based on that fascination with steam that he developed at the age of nine in his mother's kitchen, all right? Now, the first time I read that story um, was in a, a book titled James Watt, right? It was a, a story, a biography of the inventor of the steam engine, right? So of course it was no surprise to me at all that the story in chapter one about nine-year-old James was a story about the inventor of the steam engine, of course, right? Every, the whole book was about him. But to you and the people listening, unless you happen to be a history buff, that was probably a surprise at the end when you realize, oh, that was James Watt, the inventor of the steam engine, right? And why was it a surprise? Simple, because I didn't tell you his last name until the end of the story, right? Presto, surprise ending. So the technique is you take something that belongs at the beginning of the story, the main character name, right? It's, it's, it's a question number three out of the eight questions is who's the main character? Most human beings expect to know who the main character is early in the story. It's, it's natural. So you're breaking that natural expectation. Take something from the beginning of the story and move it to the end of the story. Presto, you've created a surprise ending. You can do it with almost any story. Nice. Thank you so much for all of that. And uh, I really enjoyed this interview. How can people get a hold of you if they want to uh, work with you? Yeah, thanks. Probably my website's the easiest, which is leadwithastory.com. It's just the name of my first book. I guess I wasn't more creative with naming websites after that. But uh, yeah, leadwithastory.com. It's got links there to all my books and training courses and my contact information and all that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh Really appreciate you being here. There's been some great actionable steps. Uh, remember to like, subscribe, and review, rate and review uh, this podcast. We want to be able to get it out to you and give you all kinds of tips and tricks on how you can make your business and your life a success and how you can create a new tomorrow today. I'm your host, Ari Gronich, and we will see you on the flip side next time. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate all you do to create a new tomorrow for yourself and those around you. If you'd like to take this information further and are interested in joining a community of like-minded people who are all passionate about activating their vision for a better world, go to the website, createanewtomorrow.com and find out how you can be part of making a bigger difference. I have a gift for you just for checking it out and look forward to seeing you take the leap and joining our private paid mastermind community. Until then, see you on the next episode.